as Chief Information Officer of Foley and Lardner, which is a law firm that has a strong presence at Duke every year at interview season, also sponsors uh, scholarship and has several Duke alum among its firm. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Doug. Thanks. Um, I, sort of this the small intimate group here. So I was I was speaking in my, I was telling Ken I was speaking in Miami on Friday to a law firm CFO uh, seminar, and when I walked in the room on Thursday, the room was packed. I mean there were like 100 people there, and another uh, technology director from the West Coast and myself were doing the uh, technology thing to CFOs, and I used to be a CFO, talk about bean counters without getting in trouble. And uh, when we got up, the it was the last session on Friday, so the last session <coughs> is death anyway. What made it worse was they were, there was a gentleman who was speaking before us talking about retirement plans. I mean, talk about dry. <laughs> and so about 15 people left when he was on. So A, <coughs> you don't want to speak at the last, last session of a conference on a Friday afternoon. And you don't want to speak, you definitely don't want to speak after someone talking about retirement plans. Um, so anyway, they uh, got in there and we were rushing and, and the people were starting to get up and I got to the microphone and said, don't leave, don't leave, you're gonna miss the secret technology briefing. And I encouraged people to sit back down. Most of them sat back down and, and actually they stayed till the end, so it, was, uh, so it was pretty good. What I want to talk about today is communications with the clients and uh, some changes and evolutions that are going on in law firm technology. Um, not everywhere, but a lot of places. And uh, I'll probably, my prepared remarks are about 30 minutes and then leaves plenty of time for either questions and answers about what I'm talking about or questions and answers about, about anything you might want to ask about law firms and law firm technology. Um, I've got plenty of time. My flight doesn't leave till five something, so I'm not in any kind of, of, kind of rush here. Um, I'm going to jump ahead of slide and then back up. I'm going to talk about something using I, I spent a couple of years as a consultant, so most consultants have to use a grid or something to, to talk about. It's just a consultant type thing. But this isn't my grid. This is from Richard Susskind. I'm going to use it to talk about how technology impacts, <coughs> <coughs> impacts um, uh, the, the changes and evolution in technology. But before I do that, I'm going to jump back and really talk about what, does, what kinds of technology is used between law firms and lawyers and their clients. There's a lot of different things. You've probably heard a lot of this, and we can come back to this slide at the end and talk about, you know, what kind of specific things if you like. So feel free to, to ask me to come back to this. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time up front just to talk about some of the types of things that can be done using technology. One is deal rooms. Um, you probably heard that term. It came about a couple of years ago, especially if you're looking interested in transactional type law. Um, if you're doing a deal, you're doing a um, IPO or some kind of buy, or acquisition, or purchase. It's a, it's a website, an extranet site that can be used to house all the information, all the documents and, and um, such for, the, for the, that particular deal. Before what used to happen is, is um, in, in the ancient days, five or six years ago, um, lawyers would <coughs> fax back and forth different kinds of ver uh, versions of documents and all sorts of type, types of things, get around on big conference calls and such. Um, in the really olden days, about two or three years ago, um, what lawyers typically did to exchange documents was send them by email, and a lot of that still happens. But what's really started to happen over the last three to two to three years is creating a website where all the documents can go, everybody has the current versions, because if you just email things, sometimes you might get it, and you might get it, and you might get it, but the gentleman in the back somehow fell off the distribution list and didn't get it. Or am I dealing with the latest version? You don't know. So if you have a one repository, a website in, in this case that everybody can get to from wherever they are, um, it really makes it handy to know you're dealing with the, you know, the proper universe of, of documents and, and other things that pertain to the matter. Matter management. Uh, this is where we found a lot of use for extranet type technology. I'm going to talk about extranets, but it isn't just extranets. You can use a lot of different types of technology, but extranets are the, the current sort of uh, vogue. Five years from now, we'll probably look back at extranets and say, why were we using that crap? Um, but that's what we have today. So, um, but matter management. A lot. Of, this is where we found really uh, a lot of use. Where a general counsel or an associate general counsel at a client uh, uh, law department, uh, maybe we're working on five different matters for them, and they just want to find out what's up with the with matter number two. Um, historically, what happens? You end up playing telephone tag with your lawyer, trying to find, you know find out just what's up. So we've used a lot of extra nets to just sort of uh, it's, it's sort of in in a, in a way a docket. Um, whether it's uh, litigation matters or transactional matters of, you know, these are the matters, these are the status, 
This is what's going on with respect to what's in the calendar upcoming. Uh, these are maybe documents that we're exchanging with it. Um, these just a status report of what's up, what are we doing. And a lot of times the associates get to provide the content for that, keep that updated. Because with any kind of web technology or web device, it's, it's content that's, uh, use an overworked <coughs> cliche, but it's content that's king. So if you don't put anything in it, you don't get anything out of it. And a lot of, y y there's a lot of talk going around now that extranets are really sort of, eh, who cares? You know, our lawyers don't use them, our clients don't want them. That really happens when you really haven't done a good job of, of, of implementing it and you haven't kept the content up. If you're using an extra net for matter management to communicate with your general counsel on what's up with, with matters, um, if you keep it up to date and you put, provide good content in, you tell them what's going on, it will be used, trust me. And it will really, really tie the client to you. But if you create one and say, okay, we're going to create this great extra net, we're going to do this, all this stuff, and then you use it for you know, two, three days or a week or two weeks, and then nobody ever updates it. It's you know so it's not really worth too much, and that's where I think a lot of the talk these days is is talking about well you know extra nets aren't really so good. <coughs> where we also find out is that is even internally <coughs> it's a good thing because if you're updating the a matter management site, you as an in-house inside lawyer inside the law firm always have one place to go to to find out what the latest status is because maybe there's you know one of your peers is working on the case as well. Document management, um, do you get, see any document management systems while you're here, Ken? Not that I know of. Okay. Uh, document management system is your, your backpack, right? Um, document management systems uh, in, in many lawyers' offices are, are, are sometimes there, uh, well, not so much document management, records management systems sometimes are uh, uh, the lawyer's office, the floor. You look at it and you see a bunch of piles of red welds around, and then if you want to go to off-site records management, you go to the car or trunk. <laughs> um, but in, with respect to document management, um, two main two main systems out there: PC Docs and iManage. Uh, we use iManage, um, and what it, a lot of lawyers look at it and say, you know, it's a it's a really pain to do this to keep track of this. But um, if you're in tune to it, and most firms require it. Um, it's always you know you know where your documents are. You can always find them, and you can always find it if so and so left the firm but prepared a document. Um, the, you can still find that document. It's not on his hard drive that got wiped out when he left. But uh, lawyers uh, who have moved into corporate law departments and have come from law firms with document management systems see the need and have the desire to use document management systems. But historically, corporations, corporate law departments really haven't had them. Um, if you really look at um, um, corporate law departments, they've typically been at the bottom of their technology food chain. If you go into a corporation, let's say Kmart, and you're working in the law department, typically, you know, the, the IT, if the, if the general counsel gets money for technology, that's good. And more and more now these days they are. But even if they get funding for technology, for legal technology in the law department, the IT people in the corporation don't really know legal technology systems. At Kmart, it's a retailer, so the IT people know retailing systems. If it's a manufacturer, they know the manufacturing systems, but they don't know the, the legal systems. They ask for a word, and you get words straight out, you know, straight out of the box with shrink wrap. You don't get any pleading or templates, or you don't get document management systems and the other things that lawyers typically need. I'm going to sidestep for a half a second here. And I meant to pass out some handouts, so I have this on on the screen. Um, included in the handout are two articles. One is an article that I had published in uh, Legal Times in January that talks about um, general counsels being on the tech bottom of the technology food chain. Another article is, is, uh, was published the, the same month in uh, Corporate Legal Times about the partnership between Johnson Controls, a Fortune 100 company, and Foley and Lardner and how we use technology, sort of what we're talking about today. So it's a, it's a real world, real life type thing. Um, litigation case management, we've been using litigation case management for years with, with clients. It's sort of like the, was the, the first thing that was really done because of the, the need and the large, uh, often times the large number of documents. Litigation document imaging and administration, the same thing when you get a, you know, if you have a one box, you know, one box full of, of uh, discovery documents, you can usually get by by looking through them. But when you've got a million documents, you can't page through them anymore. And even if you could, could you file it back in the right spot? So typically we image all those. <coughs> collaboration, various types of collaboration techniques, whether it's a litigation type uh, matter or a transactional type matter, 
to uh, just work back and forth between the general counsel and the lawyer as far as uh, exchanging documents or ideas. Uh, research services, uh, corporate law departments typically have limited access to research services, not, um, not like a law firm or a law school. Um, again, a lot of that comes from the, the funding issue and they just haven't uh, really had the need. And then extranets and new legal service products, and that's really sort of what we're going to talk about. <coughs> this is um, it's called The Grid. It's from Richard Susskind. Richard Susskind is a professor um, of uh, law and technology in the UK. Uh, he's worked extensively with the court system in, in the UK and also with large law firms such as Clifford Chance and Freshfields. Um, has been knighted for his work as well. He's published two books. His latest book is um, The Transformation of Law. Uh, you can get it on Amazon.com. And um, that's where this, uh, this is the first part of that book, basically. And uh, I first met Richard about three years ago when he was the keynote speaker at Legal Tech in New York. And I've met him and talked with him a number of times since. I last saw him la last year in Florida, and I was talking about the, um, the evolution of law firm technology moving out toward clients, toward corporate clients, and actually becoming part of the general counsel's toolkit, so to speak. And I was talking to him about seeing, having seen that trend over the last year or two, and he sort of said the same thing. And when we talk about the grid, we're going to talk first about the law firm grid, and then on top of it, we're going to overlay the, the grid for the law department. And so we were talking about that same thing, and at first his grid didn't have the law department on it. And as we were talking, he said, well, you know what I did, Doug? I, I'm seeing the same thing you are, and I've sort of added the law, firm, the law department to this, or, or I think it was sort of in line. So whatever side of the ocean you're dealing with, this is, this is sort of happening. If we look at the grid, if we go across the horizontal line, there's technology on the left. That's the, the, the brick and the mortar, the email systems, the networks, you know, techie type stuff. If you go across to the right-hand side, we're dealing with knowledge, the intellectual property of the lawyer. And if we go below the line, we're talking about things internal to the law firm, internal systems, so to speak. And above the line are things external to the law firm, reaching out to the client. I'm going to show a number of different um, variations of this, but it's really saying the same thing in a couple different ways, one of which may click with you. If we look in the lower left-hand quadrant, we're really looking at the internal use of technology. Um, and the next slide will list some of those examples, so I, I won't uh, belay the point. On the <coughs> right-hand lower quadrant, internal management of knowledge, again, that's to your intellectual property, because what the business that we're in as law firm technologists is really the communications business, taking the intellectual property of the lawyer and having it, being able to communicate it some way to a client, whether that's through a written document, through an email, through a fax, through an extranet site, whatever, somehow, or through telephone, uh, somehow your thoughts on and your opinions need to be expressed and communicated. In the upper left-hand uh, quadrant, external technology links, such as email links to clients, and the upper right-hand quadrant, provision of access to knowledge. And we're going to talk about that quadrant a little bit more in, the, in a minute. Another way to look at it um, is lower left, back office technology. Um, lower right, internal knowledge systems, uh, brief banks, uh, precedent banks, know-how systems. Upper left, client relationships systems. How do you tie the client to you uh, and create a, create a stronger bond? And on the right, online legal services. And again, we're, we're delve into that in a minute. Some examples, I'm not going to read all of these, but uh, just one or two, just to give you an idea. The lower left-hand corner, these again, these are the internal systems, marketing databases, time and billing systems, the internal stuff, back office. <coughs> uh, and this is really where, uh, well, I'll come back to that. And then the right know-how systems, know-who uh, know systems, the know-who systems being client, uh, client relationship systems, you know, um, uh, address books and more advanced things than, than just standard address books. <coughs> Different types of precedence libraries, brief banks. We've tried to do brief banks for years. Typically a lot of what happens with knowledge management systems and going back 10 years or so and when we try to do with brief banks, identifying good precedent documents was that it, it worked in a few places where, where a lawyer had an interest in it, invested the time, and typically when that lawyer left, nobody else really cared about it, and they sort of went, went by the wayside. There's a renewed interest in knowledge management, um, and it's getting more attention now, both internally and externally. I think still there's a lot of um, cultural issues that need to be resolved, and if I, I have an article coming out in Law Technology News this April issue that I talk about some of the um, buzzwordy, buzzwordiness of knowledge management. Um, Upper left-hand corner, online financial reports, meaning that if you're a general counsel, you want to know what, 
what, what you're going to be billed for next month. Because the one thing general counsels hate is they hate surprises. The one thing, if you go talk to any general counsel, the one thing they want to know is, don't surprise me. Um, because they're, they have to report to their CEO, and their CEO is really looking at the law department as a cost center, both to, to mitigate cost and both to hold down their own internal cost. And what the, what the CEO doesn't want to be done, surprised with is finding out that some, uh, a litigation matter that was anticipated to going to cost them half a million dollars is now going to cost them $10 million. So any way you can eliminate surprises for the general <coughs> counsel, that's the number one thing general counsel say is don't surprise me. So if you can do it with financial reports as far as letting them know what's coming as far as next month's billing or what you're working on, how much time is being accrued, uh, that's helpful. Matter of status reports, we talked about that as deal rooms and other things. <coughs> Another way to look at it, lower left hand quadrant, is um, keeping basic systems running, a competitive risk if you don't have up to date technology, and I'll show you a risk of that in, the, in a few minutes. Uh, providing robust systems. The lower right hand corner, efficiency, uh, pr productivity, leveraging knowledge, finding new ways to. Uh, to use the same knowledge over and over again. Typically what happens in law firms is, is um, uh, individual lawyers will create documents and then they will, basically they're the only ones who use them. And there's never really a lot of document sharing or reinventing, it's always reinventing the wheel. I think one of the um, historical trends in, in law schools, and, and why this happens is, uh, one of the historical <coughs> trends in law schools is that as law students, you're, uh, at least historically, I don't know how it works here, you're basically driven to compete with each other and, and driven to produce your own work on your own time by yourself. If you go to a business college, a graduate business college, you're really brought in to work as teams and you do projects as teams. And I, we see that in, in law firms too, especially from a technology point of view where, where the, the culture is that, that lawyers, they, they, don't wanna, they don't wanna spend time in, in doing this kind of work for, for two reasons. One, they don't have the time because they're not being, they're, they're, you know, they want billable hours and they're not getting billable time credit for this in many cases. Um, and there just isn't the propensity to, to share. And um, that's, I guess, one of the, the difficulties that we face as, a, as an industry. In the upper left-hand quadrant, new improved ways of delivering traditional service. Um, whereas the upper right-hand quadrant is new service opportunities and, and new business models that turn value into knowledge. If you really look where technology, if I back up a second, look at where we historically spent a lot of time in law firm technology, it's been in this lower left-hand quadrant, doing the brick and the mortar, the infrastructure, all that kind of stuff. We really started over the last couple of years to branch out in here and really what we're really getting to is really actually going in now and providing uh, systems to clients. <clears throat> Another way to look at it, below the line, we're really dealing across these two lower boxes with cost of, how do we provide cost effective service efficiency, and the upper uh, box is better service. <clears throat> Another way to look at it, uh, well, uh, this is the same way to look at it, but what, what I want to talk about here is what's, what's an advantage and what's a must have. If we go back three years ago or even two years ago when we said your law firm, you could offer a client an extranet, uh, extranet technology, that was a competitive advantage. But is it a competitive advantage today? I think it's a must have and I'm going to show you dramatically why, why I say that. The interesting thing with technology is that it's ever evolving, ever moving and what is a, an advantage today will just be a must have tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> new service opportunities, um, let me go back to um, here. Let's talk about the upper right-hand quadrant. Um, advanced generation websites, virtual lawyers, online legal guidance systems and business systems, what does all that mean? Um, an online legal guidance system, it, let's say for example, um, if you were married and you decided that you, need, you didn't want to be married anymore and you needed a divorce. So you know, it's like, okay, I needed to get a divorce. I've never gotten a divorce before. I don't know what, what I need to do. I have no concept of what I need to look at. So what I can do is I can go online to an online legal guidance system. I don't call it Divorces Are Us. And it, it might tell me that I need to worry about you know, the reallocation of my, my insurance policies. I need to, re with respect to my children, I need to be concerned about these issues. Um, with concern to my income taxes, I need to, be concerned about these things enough to give me some basic information, some basic, some basic, uh, uh, basic foundation with which to ask more intelligent questions. The idea would be that 
as if I went to this site, that I would, when I needed more substantive information or I actually needed legal work done, I would go to the, to the creator of that site, that law firm in this case, and have them do my substantive work as well. You can apply it to, into business as, let's say I'm a, uh, I'm 57 years old, I own a $300, a $300 million business, um, it's just mine, I own it myself, and I want to retire in five years. How do I retire? Do I turn the business over to my children? Do I sell it? How do I, how do I if I want to sell it, how do I go about selling this? Um, so I could go to a legal guidance site, and, you know, Business Sales or Us or whatever, and find out some basic information, and then hopefully go to the, you know, go to that law firm or whatever, or accounting firm maybe in that case, and, and f actually have them do the substantive work. Another example would be I'm an owner of a small company, I want to do an IPO, you know, how do I do that? I don't know anything about it. In our case, we have a site similar to this called eFoley. It's a technology <coughs> law site, and it's at eFoley.com. And we have, I'll show you a piece of it in a minute, and um, it provides that kind of basic information that then uh, we can provide additional work as well. Business systems, <coughs> the, the article about Johnson Controls in there really talks about business systems. And some examples are, for Johnson Controls, uh, Johnson Controls is a, uh, like I said, a Fortune 100 company. They uh, do more than just thermostats, which was the, which their founder invented the first thermostat. Um, but they do a lot of things. They manage, uh, they do facilities management. They manage K Kennedy Space Center. They manage the Pentagon as far as keeping, tr you know, maintaining the facilities. They manage the Kremlin. Um, so they they do a lot globally. They also are very big in the automotive industry. Pretty much most uh, American cars you get, your whole interior is d actually built by Johnson Controls. They build the interior, then they ship it to the uh, automobile plant. They put the interior inside, all the headliner, the stereos, and all the other things, knobs and everything are Johnson Controls. They're also one of the biggest battery producers in the world. If you go to Walmart and buy a battery, you're not buying a Walmart battery. You're buying a Johnson Controls battery. You go to Interstate Batteries and buy a battery, you're buying a Johnson Controls battery. If you get a Nissan, you're buying a Johnson Controls battery. Um, so they're one of the biggest battery producers in the world. Um, so they do, they do a lot of different things. But we, as Foley and Lardner, um, one of the areas we work with them uh, is as their um, labor law counsel. Any labor law uh, information is, uh, or, or work is done by a Foley attorney. They have, a, they, have about, uh, they have a small law department. I'm trying to think how many people maybe 20 or 30 that are spread around the globe. Um, so if, if anybody has a labor law issue, they, c they come to Foley. And we have a site, um, if for example, uh, one of their human resource managers wants a, an employment law form, any kind of HR form, we actually maintain those forms, our attorneys do. It's not a Johnson Controls person. And we have them sitting in an in a extranet site that we host. But it, let's, let's say uh, an HR manager in the UK wants an employment, uh, employment <coughs> form, they go to the Johnson Controls intranet, the internal Johnson Controls website, to the, uh, their, <coughs> their section. They select that form, and actually what they're linking to is a Foley and Lardner um, extranet. And so really what we've done here, and this is a, a key part, is that now we're not just using technology to propise the GC of you know, what's up in the matter, what's the status. We are actually providing production technology, a real business system that the GC is using, the whole corporation is using out in front. Um, so it's no longer just backroom stuff. It's really the general counsel has a, has a, a job that, that he needs to provide information to the corporation. And how does he does that? In today's world, he does it through systems and technology uh, as far as the dissemination of information. But at many times, the general counsel, the law department can't get that technology assistance to make that happen. But he still needs, he's being driven by a CEO to provide information to the company. And how can he do that? Well, law firms understand law firm systems and can help do that. Um, our relationship with Johnson Controls is interesting. It's sort of a new, way of, new wave of relationships. Um, we actually, for our labor law type stuff, we don't, we don't bill by the hour. Um, every <coughs> year, a fixed fee is negotiated. and. Um, it's, a, it's a true partnership uh, approach. Um, we make money, they save money, and everybody's, everybody's sort of happy, and every year it's looked at and said, you know, did anybody get screwed? Um, 
benefit to us is one of the one of the things law firms like to do. One of the things lawyers like done is to get paid for their work, uh, so you don't have to keep calling your clients, hounding them to pay the bill. Um, the way this relationship is that the general counsel of Johnson Control says pay their bills. You know, the bill comes in from Foley, it's paid within two weeks. Um, if there's any discussion, it takes place after that, but they don't hold on to bills for us, you know, just to make an inquiry. Um, so that's one of the, the gives and takes that's going on. Uh, we also do it, I think it may say in the article, uh, also talks, to, we also do with um, intellectual property aspects with uh, non-disclosure agreements. Uh, a lot of times, uh, a lot of times, uh, the attorneys, Johnson Controls attorneys, will need to provide an NDA for some of the technology they're doing, and um, and will um, instead of having to create and get on talk to the attorney, and, and it used to take three days to do an NDA, because the Johnson Controls attorney would have to call the Foley attorney, and then they discuss it, and get back and forth, and make changes and stuff. Now it's done in an online system. The uh, associate general counsel gets on, does a um, uh, answers a few quick questions, and out pops the NDA. We also use uh, extra nets for pizza delivery, and if you ever want a, a pizza <laughs> delivered, you can make a request online, and have it tr magically transformed and passed across the table to you. So really, what's must have and what's advantage? That's where we sort of left off. This is a page from a proposal from Kmart Corporation that we received about a year ago, August. <coughs> and I had sort of I've been seeing a trend for the, that technology was more and more a requirement for law firms and lawyers to be able to get to get work. But this is the first time I really ever saw it in black and white. I'm going to read some of this. Um, if your firm is interested, in th this is, Kmart was looking for a law firm to do their labor law nationwide, uh, to be their, their mm -hmm. labor law counsel. And if need be, to hire regional counsel and others, but to be the main, main lawyers for all their labor law. If your firm is interested in being considered for this role, please submit a proposal that describes your experience in and ability to provide the services listed below. I'm going to skip one for a second. Two. Employment litigation representation on a national, regional, and or local basis. Three, creation and management of a regional council network, if applicable. Four, representation with respect to multiple plaintiff class action and public accommodations, ADA litigation. Two, three, and four, typical legal stuff. I mean, you would see that in any proposal for law firm services. Um, but number one, implementation and maintenance of an extranet-based litigation management reporting system. They want to electronically um, understand what the law firms were doing for them. They didn't want to have to deal with paper. And if you go down to the next line, next paragraph, the coloring is mine, but the underline is theirs. Your proposal must include the provision of litigation management services under number one above. You may include anything else in two, three, and four. You can mix and match it. But if you didn't, if you didn't have technology, <coughs> don't even bother responding to the proposal because we don't want you as our law firm. And we're seeing this more and more since then, since this was 18 months ago. I've seen about uh, three or four more formal proposals of this type that have this kind of verbiage in here. So if you're not a technology-enabled law firm, if you're not a technology-enabled lawyer, um, general counsels more and more don't want you because they don't have time to deal with masses of paper and trying to figure out what you're doing. They want an easy place to do things. They want an easy place to do things with no surprises. Um, this is dramatic because if you think, well, if, if you've been in, if you, have, if you were in law firms um, just even a couple years ago, and especially even dealing with some of the senior partners, um, not so much at Foley, but in other places I've, where people I've talked to, you know, it's hide your head in the sand. It's like, you know, you know, the, you know if the joke eight years ago was, you know, uh, eight years ago, well, I'm going to tell you a story. The, um, uh, when I was with a law firm in Arizona, um, it was a relatively good sized law firm, not like Foley, we have about a thousand attorneys this week. Um, but but um, the senior partner, the big deal maker, he was a M&A guy. And <clears throat> I was in his office one day with the executive director and we were talking about technology. And he could not understand why any lawyer would have a computer on his desk. This is five, six, seven, eight years ago. Why any, it's a secretary's tool. Why would anybody do that? 
Um, and then a, a funny thing happened. We put in, uh, we put in Windows. Um, and we put in a new e Windows-based email system, and everybody's using email systems. Of course, Bob doesn't have a computer on his desk, and, and I remember it, it was a board meeting one time, and I wasn't there, but my boss was, and there was uh, the, about 10 people on the board of directors, 10 lawyers, and, my, and uh, Bob started talking about to these, his peers saying, you know, this new email system, you know, it just, it's terrible. It makes so much more work. You know, I just get stacks and stacks of paper all the time for my secretary. I don't understand why, this, why we have this. And all, all the other, his peers were looking around going, Bob, what are you talking about? Well, you probably know what he was doing. He was having his secretary print out every single email, and so he, every day he had you know, a stack of you know, 30 or 40 or 50 emails to go through. Um, that was just eight years ago. Um, but what's, what's sort of turning things is, is your clients. That same firm, there was another attorney who wasn't bad as Bob. Uh, his name was Steve, but he was, a, 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 it was an insurance defense attorney. And he wouldn't, I talked to him about computers one day, and, and he didn't want to, I mean, to do it. He, he saw the value of it. He, <coughs> others could use it. That's fine. It wasn't as bad as Bob. But, but he didn't, you know, he just didn't want one. Didn't see the need for it. Didn't have a need for it. And one day I was sitting in my office, and Steve calls down and um, says, you know, can I talk to you about computers? And I was like, you know, looking at the, the little message thing, is this Steve? And, and it was. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to take the opportunity. I'll do it, do it now, you know. I'm not going to lose this opportunity, so I'll, I'll be right up. And so I went up, and, and what happened was State Farm was his big client. And State Farm was automating and putting things in databases and wanted all their lawyers to use this database. And so State Farm said, thou shalt use a computer. And Steve said, I shall get a computer. And it was, was interesting. And six <coughs> months later, he became one of the, the, the uh, most proficient computer users of all the attorneys in the firm because he had a reason to do it, and it was, it was definitely client-driven. But um, more and more, we're, we're, we're seeing this, and so it's, 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 we're still, there's still some resistance among some of the older attorneys of, you know, do we, do we really need this stuff? Um, and, and historically, it was treated, technology was treated as a cost in a law firm, but really it's an investment, and it's the third largest investment that law firms make besides facilities and people. So how does this work with the, how does, we've been looking at this lower grid, the law firm grid. How does this work in relationship to the law department? I sort of talked about it a little bit. And what we can see is that <clears throat> our external systems here in the law firm, our client relationship systems, our online legal systems, ways to provide knowledge, um, like the NDA thing I talked about and other things that are talked about in that Johnson Controls uh, article. Um, our, our front office systems, so to speak, our client facing systems, really become the back office systems to the law department. And also, whether it's the true back office systems like emails and things like that, or, or the, the, the system I talked about with the um, uh, uh, human resources forms, or various types of knowledge system being able to provide knowledge up to the, to the company. Um, And it can just not be relation, uh, systems from law firms. It's all types of external advisors, whether accountants or others, or maybe investment bankers as well. And then what we can see, if we just look at the law department, these external systems, the, the law department will have its own back office systems, its own systems that are internal to the law department, but also feeding them and becoming part of that as systems from law firms. And then those are passed through to the actual co company, the business units of the company, and actually become some of those online systems, like in the online legal services, the human resources system I talked to that we use for Johnson Controls is actually a system that we provide that, that uh, goes through the law department and actually becomes a production business system for Johnson Controls Corporation. That's, that hasn't been done before. That's, I mean, I'm, saying, I'm not saying we have, we're the first ones to do it. What I'm saying is, historically, um, that hasn't been done. Um, most, of the, most of the technology um, between law firms and, and um, law departments has been just here, just telling the GC what's going on. Never really before until recently have we actually been working with the GC to help him or her um, provide the, the systems that they're being asked to provide to their company. <coughs> what do we do for some of it? Um, I mentioned eFoley. I'll, I'll show you a page for that in a second. And we do a bunch of other different types of uh, extranet technologies. Um, one example um, 
we, this is similar to what we do for Kmart. This is for Walgreens. Um, this is an H uh, employment law site where we have uh, where HR managers and Walgreens, wherever they are, can go into this <clears throat> and get Walgreens employment policies and forms. We maintain the forms. That's how part of the way we make money on this is with it from the time and billing aspect. Either it's a either it's a fixed fee deal, or if it's a time and bill time and materials type thing, uh, hourly rate. We make our money and provide you know updating the forms and keeping those going. Employment law updates, just information, the intellectual <coughs> property that you have as far as what's going on with labor law issues. Uh, human resources tools and checklists. Uh, this is helpful know-how tools and checklists for human resources managers on a variety of employment law topics. Um, HR question and answer forum where Walgreens, in this case Walgreens, HR people can uh, go onto the website and propose a question that's then answered by a Foley and Lardner lawyer. Uh, council information, this is guidelines, forms, and contact information for use by their general counsel office versus just the HR managers. And Foley and Lardner attorneys on the Walgreens team, a quick, easy way to uh, find out which Foley people are, you know, do they need to contact with phone numbers, email addresses, and, and things like that. So that's an example of a labor law type site we do. <coughs> this is an example of a bankruptcy site. This is for South Trust Bank in Florida. And um, across the top, we have the matter name, supervising Foley partner, responsible bank officer, date files, services requested, hearing dates, public sale date, FNL file number. Um, and then behind the blue uh, typing, you can go in and, and, and click on it and find more substantive information. So this is sort of a matter management type site where their bankers want to be able to go in and say, you know, what's going on with this bankruptcy? And um, it keeps it all posted and, and relevant. We do a similar site with foreclosures. Um, that's what this is. Uh, again, matter name, supervising partner, uh, FNL partner's uh, loan number, the date received, services requested, uh, hearing date, public sale date, FNL file number. Again, you can click on the, the blue and go into more detailed information as far as what the status of that particular <coughs> foreclosure matter is. <coughs> Um, this is a project that Mutual Omaha did. It was a, a, dis, uh, a dis, um, due diligence project. They called it Project Phoenix. The topic or area of due diligence, um, name of the individual they met with, list of documents. So this is sort of, in a way, a deal room because the due diligence has a lot of different types of documents, a lot of different kinds of discovery that has to take place. And it's not just uh, formal documents. It could be images. It could be anything. And um, so this was, in this particular case, a nice, you know, web-based site to, to track do, their, do, their due diligence project, if I could get it out. <coughs> this is a page from eFoley. And this is the, the online legal guidance system type uh, uh, page where, let's say I'm a, uh, or let's say you are a manager in a company, you, know, you may not be a technology person, but you're a business unit manager and you have a need to buy some software from some vendor. And you don't know anything about it, so you can go into eFoley.com, and one of the things you can pick up there is an example of a software license support and maintenance agreement. So you can read through and see what a, a standard agreement should look like, and on the blue spots, you can mouse over those and get more uh, detailed definition of just what the heck it means. Um, in this case, I'll license software, the definition of license software should be as broad as possible, encompassing, and it goes on and on and talks about different things. So this is then, the idea then is that if you aren't a client of ours, you might come to us and, and approach our attorneys to do the substantive work. You may be a client of ours, and that's great, because if, as an attorney, if your client comes to you with some basic understanding and knowledge, it makes your job a whole lot easier. Then you don't have to explain the A, Bs, and Cs. You can get to the X, Ys, and Zs, more in-depth stuff. So that's, we use it for our current clients as well to bring them up to a, a relevant base of knowledge. Um, in eFolia as well, there's a subscription, uh, password protected subscription part of it behind that we either give to clients or uh, people can buy on a subscription basis that has more substantive information and more detailed uh, specific information in it. So in a way, it's sort of like a, a teaser or loss leader. It's marketing. Uh, another example, this is just a basic, a, a real basic matter management <coughs> one. Um, 
where these are various matters we're working on for the for the client. They can GC can click on here and find out what's up. A basic basic intranets like the labor law one with the even with the client's logo, we can put those up in about an hour. So it's not like these things require a lot of work. Some of them do. Some of the um, more significant ones, the custom ones, like we talked about with Johnson Controls, we have a web development team. We have six web developers on that team. We have a technology staff of about 125 people. Um, but some of those require custom work. But the, the typical you know, client uh, matter management type website, an hour and it's up. It's no big deal. And so that's sort of the end of the prepared stuff, but I'd be more than willing to answer any questions on this or if you have any questions about what you might expect as far as uh, in a law firm with respect to technology, um, ask away. I'm not limited to this topic. Yeah. I guess with, with those things like um, the deal rooms and that sort of thing, I assume some of those documents are confidential. Um, how do you how do you deal with you know like logins or you know just people hacking your internet that kind of thing? Yeah. How would you deal with, how we deal with security and such? Um, it's a number of different ways depending on the sensitivity of it. Typically, you know, the basic one is password password security. Um, and another is we can you know set up a VPN tunnel between a client and and uh, and us if it requires a little bit more security. But that's that's mostly you know what is done these days. <coughs> yes. Uh, what's, excuse me. What's the largest uh, learning curve? I guess that new attorneys typically uh, have to come up to speed with as far as the technology is concerned within your firm. Probably a couple. The one that came to mind is the phone system. <laughs> I mean, everywhere I go, I mean, I, going into a new place and every, all the phone systems are different. It wasn't like when I was, you know, back in the 60s, you, could, you knew how to turn the dial <laughs> and then they put buttons on. You could figure out the hold button, you know, but now it's phone systems are relatively complex. <laughs> it's sort of, I, I think of that now because we're, we're in the process of consolidating our Chicago office into one building. We had an acquisition about two years ago where we um, acquired a law firm and we had 200 people in, in Chicago in our building and 200 people in their building. It really took us about two years to find enough contiguous real estate space that we wanted. And we're doing that right now and, and the technology we're putting in there is a voice over mm -hmm. internet protocol or what's called VOIP phones, uh, computer run tele a computer run telephone system versus an old analog system. And it has unified messaging. so. So you get all your messages on your computer. It was really sort of neat. I was sitting in the hotel this morning, and, and I was connected via VPN. It was nice at the, at the, uh, the, the what, the Washington? Washington Duke. Washington Duke, is they don't charge you for high-speed access. <laughs> uh, you just plug in. They don't, normally it's like nine ninety nine a day. Um, but I was in there. I was plugged in on high-speed access going over a VPN, and I could click on my voicemails and listen to my voicemails on my computer. Um, so if you get into those, some of those newer phone systems, um, there is a little bit of a learning curve. So I, I think that's one thing to, you know, you just can't go into a place and pick up a phone anymore, whether it's VOIP or not. Um, probably another is, um, you know, you haven't seen document management systems. Um, so that would be a little bit of a learning curve. It's not a big learning curve, but I would, I would think that would, that would, that's something that's very in your face. You will find it and you will see it. You will have to use it and have to deal with it. it the, the biggest problem is, Lawyer, there's a lot of technology out there, and, and we try not to over-technology things. And we, we at Foley, we definitely try not to do toys for techies. We do technology for business purposes to help the practice of law. But probably the biggest problem we have in technology is getting lawyers to spend the time to learn how to use it. I'm not talking learning how to use all of it. You know, because there's, if you any particular application, there's, you know, four, always four or five different ways to do something. Um, but just getting people to sit down for even 10, 15 minutes to learn how to do it one way. Um, so there's a huge investment in technology by law firms. Uh, the technology budget at our law firm is $26 million. Um, so we spend money on technology, but you know, and more and more, you know, not more and more, but, but historically and even today, um, you know, a lot of lawyers will come back, not so much the, the younger ones coming out of school, but the mid-tier especially, because the older ones, they're gonna retire in four years, they don't really care. But uh, especially the mid-tier, it's like, you know, well, this, this piece of technology is junk. Well, have you been to class? Have you spent even, you know, we will send a trainer to you. We will send a, you know, uh, pick the time. At midnight, we'll send a trainer to you. Have, you. have you been to class? No. Well, how do you, do you know how to use it? No. Well, don't say it's a piece of junk. 
Yeah, so I, I would say those two things, but the document management system isn't hard to learn. It's just something that you're gonna, you haven't seen it yet, so that would be a, a key one that you have to. I would say when I want to get divorced, for example, <coughs> I need legal advice anyways. So what do you think is better of, um, with looking on a website than just going to the lawyer straight away, personally? Um, it, it's, it's not necessarily better, it's just a different way to do things. Um, yeah, it may not be a better way, but there will be some people like me who would rather learn some stuff ahead of time, and then it's <coughs> a marketing hook that if they learn from you, they might come in with your deal. Yeah, because a lot of people, especially in that kind of situation, it's like, well, gee, I really don't know if I'm, I want to pursue a divorce. I just sort of want to make some discreet inquiries. I'm sort of maybe even embarrassed about it. Um, or it could be something like the example of the gentleman who maybe wants to retire and sell his company in five years. It's just something he started thinking about. And he's home at 10 o'clock at night. He's on the web and taking a look and, oh yeah, maybe I'll find out some information on it. And now maybe there's a way to get him drawn to you. Yeah. Um, you said that your technology budget was how many? 26, 26 million. million? I mean, excuse me. <coughs> but you're a law firm with a thousand lawyers, you said. This so week, yeah. How, uh, how many, what do you think you will need to get such kind of a basic system for like a law firm of about 50, 80, 100 lawyers. I mean, that's, in my country, we don't have okay. any law firm which has a thousand lawyers in Germany. So the market is much yeah, smaller. Yeah, I'm so if you want all, to sell all this technology to, to these guys as a firm, then one, one of my it has to be marketable. Yeah, one of my peers who I've, I've met a couple of times, uh, his name is Stefan as well. He's, I don't remember which firm he's with in Germany. Um, but it's one of the these mid-sized ones. Um, so I'm a little bit familiar with the market. Our chairman also, Ralph Bohr, is, um, was until a couple years ago a German citizen. He came over here during high school, but most of his practice is in Europe and in, in Germany. So we do, do a lot of business in, in Germany. Um, what would it be, and I'm, I'm trying to think back to when I was at a firm in Phoenix, which was 120 attorneys. Um, but that was a number of years ago, too, before technology was really moving forward. Um, God, what was the budget there? I guess you could, you know, divide it by the number, you know, divide, it, divide, it, divide 26 million by 1,000, and you're going to be, yeah, that's probably going to be a little high, but um, it would probably be in there. The cost, cost per attorney, um, if you go on to look at some benchmark data, <coughs> cost per attorney a couple years ago was about $12,000 per attorney. Uh, that's about five, five years ago. Now it's up about 17000 per attorney. Um, but uh, to get basic systems, if, a lot of times if you're smaller, it's even easier because, you know, um, you don't have, you know, what I call like Foley and other all the other large, really large law firms are behemoths. And, you know, it's like trying to turn a, a big, you know, the Queen Mary the big ocean liner. You, you can't really turn too fast. If you're in a, you know, a little cabin cruiser, you can zip around and do all sorts of things. Um, yeah? Uh, what type of integration do you all do with other law firms, like when you partner with another firm? I know <coughs> this presentation was more from firm to mm -hmm. client, but uh, I'm, I'm sure there are times when you have to kind of interface with other firms. Do you all have that requirement? Um, it's not necessarily a requirement because you, you, you know, typically as if you're one of the one of the law firms, you know, you, you can't really tell people what to do, especially if it's a opposing counsel. Um, but um, we do that all the time, and really, web technology, the websites, the external websites, have made that much easier because it used to be that you would, if you had an opposing counsel or even co-counsel, um, you would have to give them access to your network, and you would have to do, you know password protect and try to maybe put it on separate servers, <coughs> find ways to build real walls around it. Um, but with web-based technology, you can throw a website out there and people can get it to it anywhere. You don't need to put out, give them special software to load on their desktop or anything. Um, so that's really made that whole collaboration type thing really easier, whether it's opposing counsel or general counsel or any other kind of advisor like an investment banker or an account that's on a deal or, or anything like that. Dr.
Casa Thank you. Very Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone take some pizza and dessert with you. <laughs>